So, so again, welcome to this webinar. I see still people coming in, but uh, I would say let's just get started. It's uh, five past the hour now. My name is Ilko Lehmans. I'm a technical advisor for the Clean Arctic Alliance. And as said, the, uh, uh, the webinar is about scrubbers, a false solution to the IMO's sulfur cap. We have a, a whole list of uh, participants here and, uh, and interesting speakers. And um, first of all, before we get going, I have a couple of housekeeping matters. And please note the information on this slide and in particular that the webinar will be recorded. And secondly, if you have any questions, could you please indicate to which speaker the question is directed and submit it via the Zoom Q&A option, which should be near the bottom of your screen. And then we will endeavor to answer all questions during a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. But if time runs out, we will follow up with a response after the event. So today's Clean Arctic Alliance webinar provides a first look at the issue of scrubbers or exhaust gas cleaning systems, which is on the agenda at the IMO's 79th session of the Marine Environment Protection Committee, MEPC, which meets at the IMO headquarters next week. We will have four presentations and we'll move straight forward from one speaker to the next with just a brief introduction. We will first hear from Sam Davin, who is a senior specialist marine conservation and shipping for WWF Canada and head of delegation for WWF at MEPC. The next speaker is Hen Oyevir, ISIS ACOM vice chair, who will speak on the ISIS viewpoint on scrubbers discharge water from ships, risks to the marine environment and recommendations to reduce impacts. The following speaker will be Ida Maya Hasselhoff, Professor Mar Maritime Environmental Science at the Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden, and also ISIS WG Ship Chair. And finally, our last speaker is Alder Chirkop, Professor of Law, Marine and Environmental Law Institute, the Schulich School of Law, Dalhousie University, Halifax in Nova Scotia, Canada. And his presentation is titled Pollution Substitution, Scrubbers and the Law of the Sea. After that, we will have some time at the end for questions and answers. However, you can also submit questions at any time, but we will answer them after all presentations. So over to our first speaker of today, Sam Devon, who will give some opening statements. Sam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elko. Uh, distinguished guests and colleagues, I am very pleased to welcome you to this virtual event co-hosted by World Wildlife Fund Canada and the Clean Arctic Alliance. My name is Sam Davin and I work for World Wildlife Fund Canada as our Senior Specialist in Marine Conservation and Shipping. I would like to express my gratitude to our panel of experts as well as to our moderator. I'd also think, like to thank each of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. We are living in a world that is confronted by ecosystem upheaval and abrupt biodiversity loss. In the past five decades, the relative abundance of wildlife populations worldwide has declined by 69%. Today, there are over 3 billion people who depend on marine and coastal biodiversity for their livelihoods. Yet, year on year, our oceans have become noisier, warmer, more acidic, more eutrophic, and subject to chronic pollution from a growing number of sources. In short, our oceans have become less hospitable to marine life, while legislation in many cases has fallen short of ensuring the sustainability of industry growth. Our future is critically dependent on biodiversity and, by extension, a stable climate and a clean environment. Sustainable and climate resilient marine transport is essential for ensuring our oceans can support the needs of all ocean users. And to this end, it's essential that we identify practices that are unsustainable, acknowledge weaknesses and gaps in the policies and regulations that govern our use of the marine environment, and take rapid and decisive action to ensure a just and equitable future where both humans and wildlife have the ability to thrive. Now, uh, to the matter at hand, uh, the purpose of our being here today is to discuss exhaust gas cleaning systems, or as they're more commonly known, uh, scrubbers. 
Under MARPOL Annex 6, marine fuel sulfur limits have progressively tightened over the past decade to curtail the negative human health and environmental consequences of polluting air emissions associated with the use of heavy fuel oil as fuel. When the International Maritime Organization's Global Fuel Sulfur Limit came into force in 2020, it reduced the maximum allowable sulfur content for marine fuels from 3.5% to 0.5%. And in emission control areas, the sulfur content for marine fuels has been 0.1% since 2015. Now, while many ships use 0.5% uh, and 0.1% fuels to comply with the sulfur cap, many others have installed scrubbers as an alternative means of compliance. And today, more than 5,000 vessels either have scrubbers installed or on order. The purpose of scrubbers is to enable ships to produce stack emissions that are, at least in principle, equivalent to those that would be produced by using an IMO-compliant low-sulfur fuel. And while this technology has generally been effective at reducing sulfur in air emissions, as well as reducing industry costs by enabling the continued use of inexpensive, high-sulfur heavy fuel oil, the use of scrubbers is deeply problematic when considering pollution implications. First, the total stack emissions from a ship using heavy fuel oil and a scrubber are not equivalent to the emissions produced by IMO-compliant fuels. Specifically, when we look at ships using heavy fuel oil in conjunction with a scrubber, they emit more particulate matter, including black carbon, which is a powerful short-lived climate forcer, than, say, a ship using distillate fuel. Second, and perhaps um, of greater relevance to our discussion today, is that all scrubbers, whether they're open loop, closed loop, or hybrid systems, they all emit polluting effluent that contains heavy metals, nitrates, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, that can accumulate in the environment and the food web and can negatively affect water quality, marine life, and those who depend on the ocean for food security, economic security, or cultural practices. When scrubber effluent is discharged, <clears throat> The sulfur captured by scrubber combines with seawater to form strong acids. When they're discharged by open loop scrubbers, this effluent is typically between pH 3 and pH 5, meaning that it may be anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 times more acidic than average surface seawater, which has a pH of about 8.1. In areas of intense scrubber use, acidification from scrubbers has the potential to drive acidification at rates much greater than acidification by carbon dioxide which has been the primary uh, driver of human-induced ocean acidification since the Industrial Revolution. And finally, I'll add that the amount of waste produced by scrubbers can be truly enormous. In WWF's Canada, uh, WWF Canada's recent report, the National Vessel Dumping Assessment, we find that ships operating in Canadian waters produce upwards of 143 billion litres of scrubber wash water or effluent each year. Globally, the amount of scrubber wash water produced annually is thought to be around 10 gigatons, according to analyses conducted by the International Council on Clean Transportation. Uh, for reference, that's equivalent to approximately 4 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. So, in effect, scrubbers have transformed an air pollution problem into a water pollution problem. With that said, I will now turn over to our expert panelists to explore the scientific and legal questions surrounding the use of this technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, for this introduction. Um, our next speaker is Hen Oyevir. I hope I uh, pronounce it in the right way. He is ISIS uh, ACOM Vice Chair, and he will speak on the ISIS viewpoint, scrubber discharge water from ships. Hen, uh, over to you. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me and can you see uh, the screen? I can hear you loud and clear, and I can also see the screen. And is it full screen? Um, I don't think it's, well, it's full screen, but you still have the, the next uh, oh. slide uh, to okay, the right. Display, display settings, sorry for this. And uh, No problem. Is it now okay? It's still the same. It's still the same. So, um, hmm. maybe try again. Yes. Uh, sorry for this. Um, is it is it now okay or it's 
Yeah, I can still see the, yeah, this is, yeah. Perfect. Okay, brilliant. Sorry for losing one minute. No okay, problem. yeah, so uh, uh, hello everyone. Thanks for inviting um, ICS to present the um, uh, viewpoint on scrubber discharge from water from ships. Uh, this is um, a pro bono advice uh, from ICS and published in uh, 2020. And I'm the advisory committee vice chair. I call myself now as partly science bureaucrat, so I have no academic background in ship scrubbers, but we have uh, fortunately Ida Maya Hasselöp who will uh, cover the, all the scientific aspects uh, following. So, uh, starting from the uh, uh, explaining what is the ICS viewpoint. As I said earlier, this is uh, pro bono advice uh, to provide impartial evidence-based analysis of marine science topics of potentially high importance to managers and society. Uh, and viewpoints allow ICS to highlight in a balanced, timely and impartial way the potential management and societal implications of maturing, uh, maturing science in our network. So uh, uh, this is uh, not requested advice, but um, uh, bottom-up advice from ICS where the we feel that the science is sufficiently mature and there is a de society demand. The other advisory products of ICS include special requests, advice, regular advice, including, for instance, the advice on uh, fishing opportunities, bycatch for protected species, and so forth. Uh, also, further advice products are reviews and overviews, ecosystem fisheries and aquaculture overviews, including ecosystem overview for the Central Arctic Ocean. So there are 10 uh, ICS advice principles, starting from document openly, and then uh, further considering the uh, clarify objectives and risks with the uh, uh, advice requesters de de deliver timely knowledge, use the best available science, apply fair data principles, uh, undergo peer review, and agree by consensus, and uh, very importantly, explain without advocacy. So we are not lobbying our advice, but we are explaining presenting and explaining the advice. And the same goes for the uh, for the uh, ICS viewpoint on uh, ship scrubbers. So the headline advice uh, on ship scrubbers is that ICS recommends the use of cleaner, low sulfur fuels, such as marine gas oil, to eliminate scrubber use and so associated impacts on the marine environment. And until this is possible, ICS proposes a set of mitigation measures. The link on the lower right, uh, right hand side is, is actually uh, the active link from where you can download the uh, advice. It's freely available. Uh, it consists of several pages. So, and those uh, recommended mitigation measures, there are, there are basically two uh, sets of those. First is that the ideal course of action would be a rapid and complete transition to the user, to the use of cleaner, low sulfur fuels, which can meet sulfur air emission limits without the use of, of scrubbers. Uh, if the uh, above recommended, uh, if, the, if the above recommendation cannot be achieved, it, it is recommended to apply other mitigation measures. And uh, until, and which is until the transition to the use of cleaner low sulfur fuels is completed, avoid discharge of scrubber water uh, to the uh, uh, marine environment. And uh, it is acknowledged here that this will require significant investment in, techno in technological advances and port reception facilities. Uh, to enable to use of closed loop scrubber systems with land based disposal and treatment. And the uh, uh, point two about on the recommended uh, mitigation me measures is that until scrubber water discharge can be avoided, ban, uh, ban, uh, ban 
discharges in specific areas should be implemented, uh, such as particularly sensitive sea areas and special areas, as uh, defined by, by the IMO. Also, set and therefore string, stringent limits for contaminants in discharge water and ensure development of standards and protocols for measuring, monitoring, and reporting on scrubber discharge water for contaminants and other parameters. So this is uh, basically it uh, in terms of the headline advice and the recommendations and all the uh, further information uh, can be found in the document, which is accessible in the link uh, in the presentation. So thank you for this. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Hen. And I think we can uh, put the link in the uh, in the chat uh, later on. Uh, I think that would be possible, or share it uh, in another way. Uh, now let's straight let's move straight on to the third presentation by Ida Maya Hasselhoff. Let's see. Can you see my you're, screen? Yeah, Pull. you're already sharing your screen. This this is going really smoothly. Perfect. Catching up Great. with a lost minute then. Great. Oh, so uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. I'm Ida Maya Hasselöv from Chalmers University of Technology. And together with Catherine Murray uh, from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, I'm also sharing the ISIS working group on shipping impacts on the marine environment, which was previously mentioned. I would like just to, to start to thank my uh, colleagues in the uh, Maritime Environmental Science Scrubber team who has helped me out with the presentation. And continuing on the acknowledgement, I would like to start to say that uh, the presentation today builds upon uh, the ISIS viewpoint background document. So the underlying work uh, to what Hen just uh, presented and then also work within the ongoing uh, EU Horizon 2020 project EMERGE. And if someone would have to leave, I will just briefly mention that my take home message with the background that our oceans and marine environment are under heavy pressure from anthropogenic activities like some uh, previously mentioned. Scrubbers account for a large share of contaminants, metals and organic compounds such as PIHs input to the marine environment. And scrubber water is highly toxic to marine organisms, also at very low concentrations. And scrubbers represent a technology that is possible to manage to reduce the impact to the marine environment. Moving on to some short statistics about scrubbers. Um, currently, uh, according to DNVGL, uh, it's about uh, 4,500 ships globally equipped with scrubbers, but they, uh, uh, according to the uh, uh, IEA, uh, it's uh, about uh, 25, approaching 25% of the global fleet fuel consumption that is actually uh, uh, burnt by ships using scrubbers. And the payback time for a scrubber installation is important to to recall that uh, it depends on the fuel price difference between other types of loose, low sulfur fuel and the heavy fuel oil. And uh, with the current prices, the, the payback time uh, for an installation can actually be as low as six months, according to the, an online calculation tool from the scrubber manufacturer, Langtech. But I would like to take uh, one step back to look into the different type of environmental impacts uh, from a ship. And uh, the starting point here is, is then the pollution uh, beyond accidental oil spills, which uh, usually gets a lot of, of interest in media and so on. So when, when we discuss environmental impacts from shipping, the ships are usually compared to other modes of transport, like uh, trains or trucks. But I would like to stress that ships rather compare to floating industries or in the case of cruise ships, uh, rather compared to small towns. And every ship has a range of different subsystems that uh, exerts 
pressures on the marine environment. And if we just highlight a few here, we have the biofouling, uh, organisms growing on the ship hull, together with ballast water, <clears throat> it can carry non-indigenous species and pathogens that may also be found in sewage and grey water. And sewage and grey water also contain nutrients, pharmaceuticals and cleaning agents. Cooling water is similar to the anti-fouling paint and uh, most often uh, release large amount of copper and zinc to the marine environment to prevent fouling on the ship hull or in the cooling system. Bilge water and propeller shaft uh, lubrication uh, discharge either oil or oil, oily residues into the marine environment. And then I should mention that if those arrows in this figure would be proportional, the uh, combustion-related deposition, either for, from the chimney or from uh, scrubber water from ships equipped with scrubbers, should be much larger uh, since they are, are responsible for a large share of the uh, contaminant load. Finally, there are different types of uh, physical disturbance uh, uh, in energy related, so noise and light and turbulence and so on. And most of these uh, systems are uh, regulated in some way, uh, primarily through uh, uh, the uh, International Maritime Organization, IMO. Uh, some of them, however, are yet not regulated and it's important to uh, uh, to realize that all the different subsystems are usually regulated one at a time and keep that in mind when we take a little bit different perspective and look into a marine environmental management perspective then you need to take into account all the shipping related pressures from all onboard systems from all the ships operating in the geographic area or water body of interest and still, most holistic marine assessment today don't capture shipping uh, pressures adequately. And of course, it's not only shipping that we need to, to uh, address. But again, as to recall what Sam said, there is a lot of uh, demands on the marine environment today, and we need to account for all human activities. So in the ISIS viewpoint, the background report, we compared the loads of contaminants from scrubbers versus other onboard liquid waste streams. So the uh, you can see the bilge water is brown, scrubber open loop scrubber water blue, closed loop yellow, and then we have the gray and black water. And the uh, data here is from the Baltic Sea in 2018. By then we had the data that uh, 99 ships uh, were equipped with scrubbers of a total of uh, more than 8,000 ships operating in the area during the year. And as you can see from, from this uh, figure, uh, on the top we have metals and in uh, the lower panels it's uh, the organic compounds, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. Um, and as you can can see without reading all the details is that the blue bars uh, representing the open loop scrubbers completely dominate the patterns. So the loads from the scrubbers actually uh, is much more higher, 10 to 100 times higher depending on the different species compared to the total load from all other liquid waste streams from all 8,000 ships in the area. So, so just to recognize that, that scrubber is a waste stream that is uh, really containing a lot of, of contaminants. So how do we then do when we model this uh, pressure of shipping? Well, uh, the Finnish Metrological Institute have a model called STEAM, Ship Traffic Emission Assessment Model. And there we combine information on different ship types and emission factors of how much uh, of the different waste stream that are produced per uh, hour the ship is uh, or per time that the ship is uh, operating. So we, from the steam model, we get discharge volumes uh, produced, and we can then combine that data with um, data on the concentration of these different uh, contaminants in the waste streams. The output looks something like this. 
this is uh, an example of the uh, scrubber water discharge in the in the Baltic Sea. And uh, when we when we then uh, continued the work uh, that we uh, produced within the ISIS uh, report, and we started to look in the Baltic Sea and compare not only to shipping related waste streams, but also other sources of pollutants, then it becomes a bit interesting to, to conclude that from uh, comparing with uh, river uh, runoff, uh, river runoff and point sources and atmospheric deposition and then the, uh, the shipping and the leisure boats, we can see that, for example, for vanadium, uh, shipping uh, accounts for uh, uh, for thirteen percent of the loads in the Baltic Sea compared to the other source is of uh, of vanadium, and for vanadium it's uh, basically the uh, scrubbers that are the entire uh, responsible onboard system. Also, copper there is uh, the primary source is the anti fouling uh, paint. But uh, we can see that we also have some contribution from, uh, from scrubbers uh, as well. And there are similar patterns for the PAHs. So uh, in some individual PAHs uh, um, are, respons are scrubbers responsible for up to 8 to 9% uh, of the loads. And this, I should mention, was uh, data from 2020 when it was 178 ships with scrubbers operating in the Baltic Sea. Now the number is um, much higher, approaching 600, I think. In the ongoing Emerge uh, project, uh, there are also a handful of... Uh, of uh, ecotoxicological labs from Europe uh, participating. So uh, for detailed questions on uh, on these results, I need to to uh, address the questions further uh, to them. But uh, what we can conclude is that scrubber water exposure uh, is uh, cause uh, negative impacts at different life stages. For example, sea urchins, copepods, mussels, and microalgae have been shown to uh, have negative responses. And uh, the, the concentrations tested uh, between 0.001% and 40% have all resulted in, uh, in negative effects. And this is uh, uh, a bit surprising that uh, even though for, for every new round of, uh, of experiments with uh, further dilutions, the ecotoxicologists have still not found uh, a uh, concentration that is so low that it does not give an, uh, a negative effect. And then... Uh, look, linking again back to the environmental management. This is data from the European Marine Strategy Framework Directive, directive uh, from the descriptors used to describe environmental status in the European sea basins. And uh, the red uh, color indicates that uh, the environmental status is considered not good. And as you can see, uh, this is uh, the ma major do dominating uh, color, and therefore this is interesting in the in the light of uh, the suggestion for uh, adoption of restrictions or ban on discharge from uh, exhaust gas cleaning systems that that should be considered in areas where any of the following indicative criteria are fulfilled. The first uh, criteria I mentioned there. This is from the from the IMO uh, guidelines that was uh, adopted in uh, at the previous uh, MEPC uh, 78. And uh, as you can see, the environmental objectives in the area are not met, either good chemical status, good ecological status, or good environmental status is not uh, achieved. Then this is a, a rather clear sign that uh, discharging scrub water in European seas is not uh, a good option. So to conclude, the uh, use of scrubbers implies continued use of he fossil heavy fuel oil 
we know that scrubbers account for a large share of contaminants, both metals and organic, organic compounds that is being input to the marine environment. We also know that scrub water is highly toxic. And as Sam mentioned, the, the scrub water discharge uh, is large volumes discharged to the marine environment. And scrubbers represent a technology that is possible to manage to reduce the negative impact if you compare with, for example, uh, uh, land runoff that's not uh, as easy to, uh, to manage. And therefore, our conclusion from marine science perspective is that discharge of scrub water should definitely be restricted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ida Maya, for a clear presentation. Uh, you're presenting a, a more holistic view of, uh, you know, shipping as well. So uh, interesting. Um, so we are now to our final speaker who is uh, Elder Chirko. And uh, what I would like to, I would like to add that, uh, please remember that if you have any question, please indicate to which speaker the question is directed and just submit it via the Zoom Q&A option. It should be near to the bottom of your screen. Uh, and uh, hope to, looking forward to many questions. And uh, now I give the floor to, uh, to Aldo. Uh, as I said, Thank you. professor at the Dalhousie University. The floor is yours, Aldo. Thank you, Chair. And uh, may I start first by thanking the Clean Arctic Alliance and WWF Canada for the opportunity to be part of this uh, very, very interesting and important uh, panel. So my topic is essentially the legal aspects of uh, what appears to have emerged as a new problem for us in the law of the sea. Hence the title of my presentation, Pollution Substitution, because the Law of the Sea Convention uh, made a very comprehensive attempt at addressing pollution in the marine environment. And lo and behold, here we are in trying to address one form of pollution from ships, we may have inadvertently created another. So what are the legal implications? That's essentially the legal question that I address. So uh, this uh, image gives you a sense of my argument in terms of how I introduce the problem. Um, I won't say much on the impact on the marine environment because my colleagues have addressed that extremely well and much better than a lawyer could. But then I'll switch onto the legal aspects uh, when we start taking into consideration the law of the sea. Um, what do we have? And why is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, known as UNCLOS, relevant for this discourse. And then more specifically, how is scrubber wash water discharge an UNCLOS compliance issue? And uh, given that we may have a legal problem here on our hands, well, what are the treaty law principles that should guide resolution of this issue? And finally, I conclude with uh, how perhaps we might move towards rectification of the problem. So introducing the problem, um, this has already been addressed by my colleagues here, but I would point out here to the IMO efforts in uh, attempting to address uh, pollution from shipping and indeed uh, with, uh, with atmospheric emissions in particular, I would highlight the role of MARPOL Annex 6 and in particular the role it plays in placing caps on sulfur limits for ships. Uh, the sulfur limits have been explained to us already by Sam, so I do not need uh, to, to replicate, but simply to highlight that uh, in order to comply with uh, Regulation 14, it is uh, possible um, to install scrubbers as long as these are set, certified by the National Maritime uh, Administration and, of course, under the guidance of uh, the 2015 IMO guidelines on exhaust gas uh, cleaning system. So the issue that we have uh, that has been explained to us already is that the discharges are really another form of pollution, pollution of the marine environment. And that takes us, of course, to the law of the sea. So 
the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, perhaps a reminder as to what it is. This is a major multilateral convention, largely regarded as the constitution for the world's oceans. It has 68 state parties. No reservations whatsoever are permitted to this instrument. And indeed, uh, the vast majority of IMO member states are states parties to this instrument. Uh, a notable uh, absentee here is the United States, but even the United States considers much of UNCLOS to represent customary international law binding on all states. And then the other point to be made about this instrument is that it generally enjoys a higher order than other uh, conventions concerning the marine uh, environment. And specifically, I point to two, uh, two provisions in the convention, Article 237, that uh, essentially speaks to this relationship with other environmental law instruments. And indeed, um, state parties under these other environment, marine environmental law instruments should carry out their obligations in a manner consistent with the general principles and objectives of UNCLOS. And there is a further provision 311, which again uh, speaks to the need for other agreements to be compatible with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So how is this instrument relevant? Well, let me first point out the definition of pollution of the marine environment in Article 1. And this is a widely accepted definition that appears in other instruments as well. And for us, what is worth noting in this is that uh, we're looking here at anthropogenic introduction of uh, substances into the marine environment, which are likely to result or, or which result in deleterious effects as harm to living resources, marine life, and so on. And that has already been explained to us by the previous speakers. So what we have here is that the discharge of scrubber wash water indeed is captured by the definition of pollution of the marine environment. So if we continue with the various provisions uh, that are relevant for our purposes here, Article 192 makes it very clear that all state parties have a fundamental duty to protect and preserve the marine environment. And uh, indeed, they have a duty to take individual and joint measures to prevent, reduce, control pollution from any source. That includes, of course, vessel source uh, pollution. And then Article 195 is particularly interesting for our purposes because in taking such measures, to uh, prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment, um, states must be careful not to transfer directly or indirectly damage or hazards from one area to another, or for our purposes, transform one type of pollution into another. So what may be happening here is our attempt to address the problem of sulfur in fuel and atmospheric emissions that uh, uh, are harmful in themselves we may inadvertently here have created um, a new form of pollution through the uh, wash water that is necessarily produced from the use of scrubbers. So we are effectively transforming one type of pollution into another. And then if I can continue with Article 196, where states have an obligation to take measures to prevent, reduce, and control marine pollution from technologies under their jurisdiction or control. And indeed, um, exhaust gas cleaning system, they are certified by member states of the IMO, and therefore that brings them into the realm of technologies under their jurisdiction and uh, or control. And then uh, I would go to Article 211, where states are required to work through the IMO to establish international rules and standards to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment from vessels. So here, basically, we have a pollution, a type of pollution from ship, and basically states can be said to have a legal obligation to work through the IMO to prevent, reduce, and control uh, pollution from scrubber wash water. Uh, there are other provisions of the convention here that would be relevant, but time prevents me from going into a more exhaustive uh, discussion. So for our purposes though, if we look at how scrubber wash water is an unclosed compliance issue, well, of course, the various uh, uh, provisions that I've uh, cited already speak to obligations of uh, states. So states have obligations to um, essentially honor um, those commitments in the law of the sea. But then if we look more specifically now at MARPOL, Annex 6 and regulations 4 and 14, 
uh, per se, these are not a legal problem um, because uh, uh, Article 14 states the limit and how we're combating uh, essentially the sulfur uh, content in fuel. Um, and then a regulation four uh, is providing for the for possible compliance, alternative compliance mechanisms. It's how regulation four is used that creates uh, the problem here. So, um, so essentially by enabling uh, 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 member states, IMO member states, to, to certify exhaust gas cleaning systems, which produce wash water, which is toxic, acidic, and problematic for the marine environment, and enabling its discharge into the marine environment, that is where the inconsistency is. So um, um, the result here is that we have uh, discharges into the marine environment that are inconsistent with the obligations of IMO member states under several law of the sea convention uh, provisions. So we a legal issue we want to address. How should it be addressed? Well, international law provides guidance in terms of how states should honor their international obligations. And the starting point here is clearly the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which provides the general rules, principles, and procedures for how states should honor their obligations under the treaties to which they are parties. And uh, first of all, of course, they should honor their obligations. They should interpret uh, um, uh, their obligations correctly. They should perform their obligations in good faith. And then if we go to UNCLOS itself, Article 303 uh, essentially is a reminder for states that uh, they shall fulfill their obligations assumed under the convention in good faith. And note, the language used here is peremptory, shall fulfill. This is not discretion. This is a legal obligation to perform those obligations. And then if we recall again, uh, Article 207 subsection, or uh, uh, paragraph two, which I mentioned earlier, that uh, a state's environment, uh, state's obligations under other environmental agreements, which would include MARPOL here, should be carried out in, man in a manner consistent with the principles and objectives of uh, UNCLOS. And I would also highlight here that uh, when MARPOL was negotiated in the 70s, um, uh, the negotiators were cognizant of the need to be consistent with the new law of the sea that was emerging and which eventually was crystallized with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And therefore, Article 9, Paragraph 2 was, was introduced here that nothing in MARPOL shall prejudice the codification and development of the law of the sea by the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea. And so on, of course, in the meantime, the law of the sea has been developed. But the point here was that MARPOL um, uh, was supposed to be uh, uh, consistent with the law of the sea. And I would argue that actions taken under MARPOL should also be consistent with the obligations of states undertaken um, under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So in conclusion, uh, my conclusion basically uh, uh, makes really uh, uh, two recommendations here that those IMO member states that are certifying exhaust gas cleaning systems are recommended to take steps to comply with their UNCLOS obligations to prevent pollution of the marine environment from scabber wash water. And the second recommendation is really directly perhaps to the IMO and the membership of the IMO, because the IMO is in a position to assist member states meet their UNCLOS obligation by revising the exhaust gas cleaning systems guidelines upon which states rely, and in order to support their compliance with UNCLOS. And I stop with that. Thank you. Thank you, Aldo. That is um, very insightful, I would say. Um, interesting presentation, all interesting presentations. And I'd like so before we we move to the Q and A segment, I would first like to thank all the speakers, and uh, wonderful to hear all your insights. So let's now transition to the Q and A session, and I think I should ask Sylvette to. Um, Let's see. 
Um, I'm looking at the Q and A session, but I don't see. You should be able to see the slide of the Q and A. Mm. I'm opening the Q and A, but I don't see any questions. Not sure if I do. Are you seeing the slide? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, um, so there's no maybe there's no questions coming in yet. Oh yes, there's one question coming in. So there's a question from Lauren Hogan. The question is, how can the scrubber water be treated to be in compliance with UNCLOS? I'm not sure who, who would be able to answer this. Well, it, since it's about uh, UNCLOS, maybe Aldo, you could take that question. And, and if not, if this is a, uh, not your expertise, then maybe we could transfer it to Ida Maya. I, I can say something very briefly, but I'm not in a mm. position to fully mm. answer this question because how suggests, well, um, what sort of technology can be used or what sort of procedures can be used? All I can say is that uh, what we have to bear in mind is in whatever action we take uh, in guiding the use of scrubbers is that it must not result in pollution. In other words, in substances that are deleterious to marine life, to the marine environment. That's basically the standard that is set in the convention. So how to achieve that, I think I would leave to other uh, panelists to answer. Mm -hmm. yeah, Maya, would you be comfortable to- uh, Yeah, to... absolutely. I can uh, add, mm. add on to yeah. Aldo's uh, response there, that uh, as we have been discussed here, many of us have mentioned that there are different types of scrubbers. So the open loop that just pass the, the wash water directly back to the sea. And then we have the closed loop systems that uh, of course sounds like there's nothing coming out, but there, uh, there is actually a so-called bleed off uh, that is rather substantial also uh, from the closed loop systems. So worldwide there, there is a handful of uh, setups that, that have truly closed systems so that they leave all of the uh, uh, residues uh, in port, in uh, port reception facilities that are dedicated to taking care of that. And that is uh, feasible because it's uh, primarily ferries that uh, don't travel a too long distance. So it's possible for them to, to uh, carry the, the waste residues produced without losing too much of a cargo space uh, during uh, the, the travel. But uh, so, so the, uh, the answer is, I would say that there are technologies to treat the scrubber water, but one should also be aware then that that comes with an additional uh, uh, cost. Uh, and uh, so to to uh, set up that type of, of uh, equipment and, and scrubber water, as we have heard, it's uh, very acidic and have high concentrations of contaminants and sometimes also nutrients. It's, uh, it's challenging to, to clean it. It rather compares to like acid mine drainage than to uh, common waste other types of wastewaters. So even if there are, are techniques uh, around, that would be imply a, a massive uh, investment in, uh, in building up such infrastructure, either in port reception facilities or on board uh, uh, the ships. So, and, and also I would like to remind that that the scrubber still would be a continued use of uh, fossil fuels, and mm. and uh, even if you manage to to clean the water, thank you. Yes, I, w I was wondering myself what uh, what happens with the uh, uh, with the discharge water, the residue when it is delivered in port. How is it treated? Are there facilities already that can treat it? 
it's uh, it's handled like uh, hazardous waste, so mm. uh, not specific for uh, for the scrubber waste, but uh, other. It's out of my <laughs> field of competence, I should say. But I know that there are uh, industries specializing in taking care of hazardous waste, and that's where the scrubber waste would go as well. Yes. Okay. Um, well, uh, I see another interesting question coming in from Isabella Guerre. Uh, she says, with regard to coming MEPC 79 and the inconsistency highlighted between laws and use of scrubber, do you consider it likely that measures could be met and taken to cater for such concerns straight away in such IMO convention? And this would be a question for Elder Chirko. Yeah, it, is it likely that uh, the appropriate legal solutions are taken here within the IMO? Um, well, it's partly political will too, um, the extent to which there is full understanding of the nature of the problem and what this means for the obligations of those very same states under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, sometimes I find, and I speak purely as an academic here, that uh, deliberations at the IMO tend to be focused so much on the IMO conventions that sometimes um, sight is lost of other instruments of international law that may also apply to the world of shipping. And I think perhaps this is one of those concerns here that even earlier, um, ever since perhaps the discussions on, his, on exhaust gas cleaning systems commence, there may not have been sufficient consideration of the obligations of IMO member states also under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So it seems to me that uh, this is something that uh, member states have to come to grips with. I know that on some of their issues in the past, there has sometimes been reluctance in the IMO to address law of the sea issues. Mm. But the reality is that the IMO is the competent international organization responsible for international shipping in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So therefore it is incumbent on the IMO to address problems caused by international shipping and which are addressed, uh, that are captured, in other words, by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, such as those that concern pollution of the marine environment. So I, I think it, it, it's going to be very difficult for IMO member states to ignore their obligations under such a major convention as the Constitution of the World's Oceans. Thank you very much. So I, I see a couple of questions that are about the HFO. I think these are these are uh, I could combine these, and maybe this is for Sam. One question is how will the HFO ban impact the usage of scrubbers, and the other is should heavy fuel oil not be banned as ship's fuel instead of trying to solve the scrubber issue? Thanks, Alko. I can I can certainly take a stab at this. Uh, mm. So with the HFO ban being introduced, the ban will be effective uh, within uh, the IMO's definition of the Arctic. Uh, however, heavy fuel oil will remain usable in uh, the rest of the world's oceans, with exception, again, of the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, so although it may curtail scrubber use in scenarios where ships equipped with scrubbers would otherwise traverse through these regions, uh, scrubbers will no, no, nonetheless remain uh a viable technology uh, for ships operating uh, within uh, non-polar regions. And I'm sorry, Elko, there's a second part to the question that you had posed. Yeah, the, the, the second part is, uh, should heavy fuel oil be banned, not be banned as ship's fuel instead of trying to solve the scrubber issue? Uh, speaking from WWF's perspective, we would certainly uh, support a prohibition on the use of heavy fuel oil globally. Uh, it is uh, our position that it is the dirtiest available marine fuel that poses a significant risk, not only when burned, but also when leaked or spilled to the marine environment. Mm. It's difficult to clean up, and we live in a 
age in a time when the availability of other less deleterious fuels like distillates are widely available and can be used instead. Yeah. And maybe there, there's such a, there's a sort of a follow-up question that is about the polar code. Question is, um, is there space under the polar code for scrubber use to be managed in Arctic waters? Again, I would say that it would be uh, a possibility, and I don't know if Aldo would also could chime in here, but uh, considering the polar code is an extension effectively of MARPOL, uh, it would likely require an amendment to MARPOL Annex 6, in, in, in my view, not as a legal expert. Yeah, I can add to that. I, Sam is absolutely correct. Um, basically, when the polar code was adopted, um, it um, there were no um, um, amendments, consequential amendments, if you want, to Annex 6. So other annexes uh, had to be adjusted, Annexes 1, 2, 4, and 5. And uh, in order to create a standard, so or rather perhaps to raise a standard under the Polar Code specifically, for Arctic waters uh, with respect to this particular issue, there would need to be uh, an amendment. Uh, at this point, um, the situation that we have is the, Arc the, is the Polar Code provides specialized rules, but then the rest of MARPOL, so that includes Regulation 14 and Regulation 4 of Annex 6, apply to the Arctic as a whole, but without any discrimination as to the particular sensitivity of Arctic waters. Okay, thank you. Can I can I say something about this uh, heavy fuel oil? Yes, of course. I think I think what the ICS advice actually says is the future. I mean, in 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 a positive manner that not not to ban anything, but I mean, what is the solution? And actually, it explicitly says that uh, the ideal course of action would be rapid and and complete a transition to the use of cleaner, low sulfur fuel, uh, which do not require uh, scrubbers. So it depends from which angle you actually look at. Yeah. Uh, I see uh, two questions by Carla Hart um, and uh, see if I can combine them. So it says, uh, can, you, can anyone address the stack emissions remaining with scrubbers as a perspective from the cruise industry, cruise claims, uh, claiming huge plumes with scrubbers are just steam um, and therefore no issue. And, um, and to clarify this, uh, the, the question remaining with scrubbers, is there a source to pursue more detailed information than mentioned in the presentation today? Mm, perhaps this is something for Ida Maya. I can, I can start uh, at least, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, so with the first, uh, uh, first question on the ship stack uh, emissions remaining when having a scrubber, I think that uh, I may not have the complete answer, but I think that the ongoing discussion at previous IMO meetings uh, on for how long it would be allowed to operate a scrubber that is not uh, working 100% because there is obviously some, some uh, it may be some uh, technical difficulties to, to get it running properly, uh, for how long that period uh, should be if it should be allowed and I know that there were different uh, suggestions uh, up to 24 hours of uh, a non-properly or non-compliant scrubber should be okay so so I guess that reflects that that is something that we we do not have uh, complete answers uh, of I can also mention that in our ongoing work in the uh, Horizon 2020 Emerge project, uh, our PhD student and a team of atmospheric uh, uh, scientists went with a, a scrubber ship uh, from uh, port of uh, Antwerp to Turkey and have done uh, simultaneous measurements on the water produced and uh, measurements in the chimney. So soon we will have a, a better answer of, of that, but it, it's a, a very a highly relevant uh, question. 
So I would say keep an eye on the ISIS uh, website and uh, publications and uh, more information to follow. Yeah, on the Emerge, I would mm. actually say. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, then there's a question by uh, Griuger McCord. Question to the whole panel. How much of the problem would be solved if there was a ban on open loop scrubbers? Could this be a compromise solution acceptable to both shipping companies and environmentalists? So a ban on open loop scrubbers, so there would only be closed loop scrubbers. Do you want me to start again? Well, please. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I can say that according to our estimates, uh, switching to only allowing closed loop scrubber could uh, reduce the loads from scrubber with some 80, 90 uh, percent. But if you recall the, the figure I showed earlier with the blue bars that was uh, very dominant, it's uh, it will still be a uh, pronounced source of contaminants uh, to the marine environment. So yes, uh, in a way, it would be a better uh, a step in the right direction, but uh, it will definitely not solve the entire uh, situation. And also something that is important to mention here that as long as scrubbers are allowed, you also need to finance in some way the, uh, the monitoring of the compliance uh, level both uh, both if you would have uh, have uh, a, a target uh, quality mm. uh, concentration set that that you need to uh, or thresholds that you're not allowed to uh, surpass then then it's uh, it, it is costly to also have the monitoring of the compliance in place Elko, if I may hop in. Um, yes, of course. Uh, to, to voice WWS perspective on this, well, open loop scrubbers are no doubt a very large part of the problem, at least uh, volumetrically. Um, as Ida Maja, Ida Maja has mentioned, even closed loop scrubbers do discharge harmful bleed off into the environment. And it will be noted that the concentration of metals and uh, organic compounds in bleed off may in fact, be significantly higher than an open loop discharge. So, in in some senses, you're you're trading off uh, volume for for concentration. Um, also, going into the bigger picture here, we we're in a period where we need to see rapid decarbonization across all industries, including the the maritime industry, and even under the the most generous. Um, decarbonization pathways that allow us to remain on a Paris 1.5 trajectory. Significant cuts in uh, carbon uh, dioxide equivalent emissions need to be made this decade mo and moving forward uh, and continuing to invest in technologies that encourages the continued use of heavy fuel oil. is It's, it's not the way of the future. It's stalling uh, progress towards the advancement of alternative fuels and the use of other technologies. So uh, from our organizational perspective, um, a switch to closed loop scrubbers uh, would not be a satisfactory solution. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Elko, if I may, uh, as, as this question was uh, actually addressed to all speakers, actually ICS cannot uh, comment on this um, or respond to this question because ICS is an uh, independent in the international science organization. So we are we are giving uh, scientific advice to managers and not not uh, uh, commenting compromises. So this is for managers and and policy advisors. Thank you. Okay. Well, then this, here's another interesting question by Zenon Cleopas. Have the speakers read any of the studies on the impact of scrubber wash water, which show the opposite of what was presented today? Uh, in the affirmative, what comments do they have? So, yeah, this this is a question that could be interpreted in, uh, in, in various ways, but uh, maybe, maybe one of you... Uh, would like to start. I'm not sure who, who I would. Uh... I can start again if, mm -hmm. if okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes, we are aware about the uh, uh, about the studies that are circulating, uh, claiming the opposite that uh, scrubber wash water is not that toxic and will, in principle, use dilution uh, that there will. That will solve the problem but for the ecotoxicological work uh, um, all of the 
um, published work um, that are around that claim that it's uh, not a big deal. They have uh, used different types of uh, of treatments of the of the samples before doing the tests. So, for example, filtering the water, which significantly reduce the toxicity, since um, much of the of the uh, uh, toxicity is explained by particulate matter uh, in the scrub water. So, uh, it's a bit uh, dangerous that these studies that are often um, often commissioned by scrubber manufacturers, for example, that uh, they are you, the consultants that have uh, done the studies, they are using uh, standardized uh, uh, testing protocols that are actually not that suitable to do the, carry out uh, adequate testing of scrubber uh, water. So, so mm, it can be explained through, uh, if you look into detail, what they have done. And our assessment is that uh, none of these studies would actually have passed through a proper scientific peer review process to, to be published. And I think that's why we see uh, this kind of conflicting results uh, circulating in, in what we refer to as the gray literature. I hope that answers okay. your question. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question, but maybe one of the other speakers uh, has something to say about this. Yes, uh, I think this is extremely important what Ida Maya was saying, and actually we discussed all this also during the formulating the ICS advice. We even even were rereading some of the uh, papers and documents to to be assured that that the advice is correct and 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 actually the the uh, the the advice is. Uh, the target of the advice is to eliminate the scupper use and the associated impacts on the uh, on their uh, on the marine environment. So, in other words, also dealing with the risks. So, so, uh, so this this was considered in the advice as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any of the other speakers comments on this? Um, I, actually, I had a I had a question myself. Is this a legal question? Uh, so uh, for Aldo, uh, so you raised the issue of inconsistency between Marple and Ankylos uh, in the case of scrubbers, but uh, I was wondering if you also see uh, see other Marple related uh, issues that could be questions uh, that could be questioned with Ankylos in hand. Actually, just to clarify one thing, I didn't say that there was any inconsistency between Anklos and Marple, but rather inconsistency between Anklos and action taken under Marple, okay. because uh, and that makes a big difference. You know, um, I don't want to suggest that Marple needs amendment uh, because it, I, I don't think it does. Uh, rather, the issue here is what we understand to be an acceptable compliance, alternative compliance mechanism because regulation four of annex six does not specify what this might be there could be different kinds of alternative compliance mechanisms and but it's up to the national maritime administrations then uh, to certify um, an alternative compliance mechanism that is acceptable so so the issue is there but it's also assisted in a way by the guidance that the imo has provided with the EGCS uh, 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 guidelines, the 2015 guidelines, uh, part 10 of the guidelines that uh, uh, essentially address the uh, the discharge of fresh water. So um, one might need to to address that rather. So so that's why I'm, I would be very careful here that the issue is not Marple per se as I see it, but mm -hmm. rather the action that can be taken under Marple. And of course, as guided by the IMO guidelines. Thank you for this clarification. That really answered the question. Uh, I see one more question. Uh, this question is for Elder Chirkop. I'm not sure if you uh, if you could answer this question, but maybe uh, one of the other, maybe Sam could answer this. The question is as such: Are you aware of any national government delegations to the IMO who are opposed to the use of scrubbers? 
Yeah, I, I'm not the best person to answer this. This should yeah. be perhaps answered yeah. by Sam, um, um, who has been actually in these sessions and listening to delegations present. Yeah. And, and, and Sam, Sam, maybe you could answer this because Sam is also the head of delegation of the WWF at uh, MEPC. Yes, uh, thank you, Elko. I think in terms of looking at states that may be opposed to the use of scrubbers, we need to look no further than which states have begun to introduce restrictions within their own jurisdictional or domestic waters. Um, when we look at uh, recent restrictions, we see certain states, uh, Belgium and France, for example, taking measures to restrict uh, the use of scrubbers within three nautical miles of uh, shore within their territorial sea. We see a number of countries that have prohibited the use of scrubbers in their ports, including Bahrain, Bermuda, Croatia, Kenya, Romania, Singapore. Um, and we also see a number of states that have outright prohibited the use of scrubbers in their territorial waters. So I would say that there are a number of states that are taking action against scrubbers, uh, at least within their own jurisdictional waters. And uh, oftentimes what we see with environmental issues is that there's a groundswell of action at the domestic or, or state level that is eventually translated into action uh, at, at the IMO. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. I think it does. Um, so we're getting to the end of our presentation. Uh, the time is almost up. So I think we should conclude the discussion. And um, if there are no further questions, well, you can always reach out to us. And as said at the start, it is our intention to make the recording of the webinar available and the details will be circulated. And may I once again thank the speakers today and also thank to all the participants, of course, and, and the team of Clean Arctic Alliance who made this possible. So next week, MEPC 79 will be in full flow and we will be back in person at the IMO headquarters for many for the first time for an MEPC meeting since 2019. I do hope that everyone will participate in these important discussions at MEPC 79 and that there will be good support for stronger measures to address scrubbers and scrubber discharges and provide the Arctic its wildlife or protect the Arctic its wildlife and its communities. So thank you again and goodbye. See you next time and hopefully see some of you next week at the IMO headquarters in London. <laughs>